and I, I, Yasha and I's work um, overlap a little bit in that um, I, I, in, in my work on, on science and technology and society, I, I've, all, I've always been pretty deeply skeptical of how, the, um, how we talk about uh, activism online. Uh, uh, way back in, in 2014, I was even I was getting, I was already getting bored with Edward Snowden, <laughs> mo mostly because, you know, like, while he, he might have been a brilliant engineer, people kept asking him about politics. And, um, and a lot of my research is about, you know, uh, engineers and their politics, and, and it, it usually skews pretty far to the right. Um, so I, I, so ba back then I, I had written um, that um, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't his background doesn't make him the best person to ask about foreign policy or even government surveillance. Uh, and what he is expert on, the keeping of secrets and the technologies that make it possible, shouldn't take center stage in imagining a new and better digitally augmented society. And so, and so like, it just sort of seemed like a, like a doomed arms race where you're like telling individuals to just get more encryption and more, uh, more ways to hide. And then that, that doesn't build anything. Um, and, and I was uh, really taken by by uh, Yasha's work because it was sort of gave a substance to it. It was like kind of a um, uh, gave a specific things to point to of like something that I just sort of felt. So uh, I, um, you know, he and he does a lot of uh, uh, historical work that in the book starts at the Vietnam War, and so I just want to really quick. Uh, even uh, proceed that a little bit and say, uh, you know, we could also look at um, one, the Spanish American War, uh, where uh, America learned to be an empire, and it was in the pacification program uh, after 1898 that um, uh, where we learned as a, as a nation how to, how to pacify people and surveil them, and it was actually the, the guy that, um, that, that ran that, Ralph Van Damon, that was later um, came back to uh, uh, the United States and helped a, a young J. Edgar Hoover set up, set up the FBI. Correct, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, if, you, and if, you're more, if you're interested more about that, I'll, I'll recommend a, a, another book, which is uh, Alfred McCoy's latest uh, book on um, uh, geopolitics called The Shadow of American Empire. But, um, uh, uh, really, all, all that all, all that's really left to say is that you know, um, it, it's 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 just so important to like really critically look at what uh, what these th uh, what these technologies do and what they stand for and what they enable and what they replace, right? And I think ultimately a lot of these technologies tend to replace politics. And if you replace technology, if you replace politics with technology, you know, you sort of like give someone permission to, you know, make the political program for you, and that's not always great, especially when it's engineers. Sorry. Uh, but, um, uh, but so uh, that, that's, a, that's a little intro to the, the space we'll be playing in this evening. Um, but, uh, and before I turn it over to Yasha, I just want to make sure, is there, um, are there any announcements uh, for the community that uh, people would like to bring? Yeah. Enjoy the latest edition of the uh, of the James Connolly Forum. Uh, uh, James Connolly uh, uh, came to the United States in uh, 1902 and moved to Troy in 1903, setting up house at 96 Ingalls Avenue, uh, not that Ingalls, not with the E. Um, uh, a few blocks from where this uh, forum takes place. Uh, he worked for the Metropolitan Insurance Company until a recession caused the firm to falter. Well, here he was active in the Socialist Labor Party, where he engaged in a notable dispute with its leader, Daniel De Leon, over the utility of fighting for wage increases. He was for this, uh, and other questions. Uh, he was supporter of a strike by women workers here. Uh, as most of you know, when he returned to Ireland, he played a leading role in great labor conflicts like the Dublin lockout of 1913, and led the Irish Citizen Army in its uprising against British rule in 1916. Uh, he was executed by the British as a result. Today, he is recognized as one of the great socialist leaders of the 20th century. I also enjoy talking about uh, 
the uh, Irish, uh, to my students uh, um, in Ur Introduction to Urban Geography, I like to tell them where police come from, where the <laughs> idea of them come from, and, and that if any of them uh, are Irish, they should, it's in their blood to not like cops. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we, uh, 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 please uh, enjoy me in welcoming uh, uh, Russian born investigative uh, journalist uh, Yasha Levine, author of the new book, Surveillance Valley, The Secret Military History of the Internet. Thanks, Thanks for the kind introduction. And thank you for uh, bringing back good memories of, of the Koch brothers and of the Tea Party movement. Because uh, it's actually pretty interesting because the Tea Party movement had a very um, big online component, and I didn't realize it at the time, but it, I, we, what we were discovering was an actually an online influence campaign. We hear about influence campaigns all the time now, foreign influence campaigns on Facebook, but uh, we don't hear much about uh, domestic influence campaigns that are uh, being organized and being conducted all the time by billionaires and the ruling class, and the, the Tea Party movement was a classic case of that um, because it was through these websites that uh, p positioned themselves as grassroots and uh, as just citizens um, standing up against uh, President Obama's proposed um, program to bail out home homeowners rather than bankers that this the, t the t Party launched uh, as a result of. And uh, at the time, the media believed that they were truly all just independent, you know, concerned citizens who cared about the debt. But in reality, uh, as m uh, my colleague and I, we started looking at the the domain uh, registrations of these of these websites and uh, who owned the, and who, when they were set up and who set them up, we found out that they're all being organized from a very centralized uh, organization, Freedom Works, that's funded by the Koch brothers. And at the time, of course, we were ridiculed and um, because MSNBC was taking this seriously, CNN was taking this seriously, Rachel Maddow was taking this seriously. She, she believed that the Tea Party was a truly organic um, movement. And uh, actually, we wrote this for Playboy, and Playboy was pressured to take down the article. And also, was, there was a there's a whole story about it. I, I didn't expect to talk about it now, but it re it recalls I, because I'm gonna, I'm talking about the internet, and this was a clearly an internet uh, influence campaign that was waged in 2009, um, and uh, but we don't hear about that anymore. Um, so. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I've never been to Troy. It's nice, nice for me to come out of, out of uh, stony Brooklyn and uh, where there's no, 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 nothing green. <laughs> it's all cold and damp. Um, so thank you for uh, inviting me out. Uh, I'll try to just set up my notes here, if you don't mind. Just bear with me for a second. Um, so yeah. So um, I'm here to talk to you about the internet today in a book that I wrote uh, called Surveillance Valley, the Military History of the Internet. Oh, uh, I even pronounced, mispronounced my own book's title. It's uh, Surveillance Valley, the Secret Military History of the Internet. And, um, and to talk about, and I think it's an important topic now, especially with all the talk about, again, influence campaigns on the internet and surveillance on the internet and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and Russian trolls and Russian bots and Russian Facebook ads um, that we um, try to have a better sense of what this medium that all this stuff is happening and taking place on, what is it really, where did it originate from? What is its history? What is its true history? Because we hear a lot about the internet, but I think as a culture, we don't actually have a very good idea of what the internet is and why it was created. Um, you know, so the internet, obviously everyone is talking about it now on the news and, uh, and it seems that suddenly everybody's afraid of it. Uh, you know, I've been doing, on a book tour uh, for the past couple of months and I've been talking to people around the US and it seems that um, a lot of people are suddenly extremely, extremely afraid of the internet and of what it can do. Um, a few years ago, a lot of these same people saw and talked about the internet as something democratic, as something egalitarian, as something that will unleash a new kind of democratic potential in America and around the world. Um, but now, people seem to believe that it has been hijacked. Um, people believe that 
some very dark forces to control of what was normally this democratic and egalitarian technology and uh, turn it into a weapon of influence and a weapon of surveillance. Uh, they turned this weapon on the American people. They manipulated the American people and in doing so helped elect Donald Trump. It started with the Russians, uh, I being born in, in Russia and the Soviet Union. I am, I think, part of this problem. <laughs> um, I would know. Um, you know, and so, uh, so ever since Donald Trump won, won uh, the news has been full of stories about how Russia, uh, with its trolls and its bots, uh, flooded the internet um, and used malicious advertising to influence people and to, to, uh, to shape their ideas. And if you turn on MSNBC or CNN on any given day, or actually many times a day, or pretty much all day, uh, you'd hear analysts talking about how what happened on the internet during the election, before the election, after the election, was completely unprecedented. Um, there had been a billion dollars in digital advertising, on digital advertising spent during the election uh, campaign. A billion dollars. It's a, it's a record. But listening to these analysts, you'd think that never before in the history of the internet has anyone done anything to try to influence people. <laughs> uh, not until the Russians came along with their $100,000 in Facebook ads. It, and, you know, people believed it. And people actually, I mean, you laugh at this, but it's not a laughing matter, you know? I mean, uh, uh, this guy named, uh, Congressman by the name of Jerry Nad Nadler, uh, you probably know of him. My uh, former congressman. <laughs> he, um, yo, you voted for him? No, 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 no but he's oh, my okay. former congressman. <laughs> uh, and yeah, high he, school graduate, same place. Okay, gotcha, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, he uh, represents a huge part of Manhattan, uh, just across the river from where I live in Brooklyn. And he uh, compared uh, what happened on the internet during the election <clears throat> as worse than Pearl Harbor. Oh. And, you know, of course, Pearl Harbor is that attack by the Japanese on an American fleet stationed in Hawaii, killed thousands of people, uh, forced America to enter into World War II, right? Uh, other people went even further, well, uh, depending on your view of this, uh, people compared it to 9-11, what, what happened on the internet during the elections. That's how dire this corruption of the internet was, and this, the use by the Russians to surveil us and to influence us with that. So that's how bad it was. 9-11 plus Pearl Harbor, both of which resulted in massive wars, uh, or led America to engage in, in massive in wars. Right? Um, of course, this, as you know, probably this panic of uh, this outrage or this panic about Russia's weaponization of the internet has fueled xenophobia and russophobia all across the country. Um, as, as someone who is, uh, has knows a lot of Russian people. Uh, it's been freaking us out, and uh, most people don't know what to do about this. And uh, are quite are staying, staying quiet and hope this passes. But this is a very good. Uh, our community has never seen anything like this. Uh, suddenly, we're the enemy within. Yes. What do you mean that the Russians are what you just said are afraid of? It's just well, when you are con constantly demonized, when a generic a Russian. Um, and when you are being demonized as some kind of potential foreign other, that every Russian who's ever been to Russia or has ever had any contact with any other Russian is potentially con controlled by Vladimir Putin and is doing his bidding, which is things that you could hear if you turn on the television and turn on uh, network news. And when you, when you have, um, when you have uh, James uh, Clapper, I believe, talking about uh, Russians as genetically predisposed to to oh, lying God God sakes, Jesus. and so when you have things like that just CNN. just said you know said on on television without comment without any an attempt by re, to re, rebuttal without pushback you, you be, it's strange uh, especially when you've never encountered that kind of open uh, xenophobia against against people of your ethnicity uh, so that's what I, that's what I mean um, but I think it goes beyond it, it's bigger than the Russian but only the R Russian Americans are Again, this applies to just about anyone who came from the Soviet Union. You might not even be ethnically Russian. You could be uh, many different ethnicities from, from the former Soviet Union. But of course, it goes bigger, it's much bigger than that because this hysteria about the weaponization of, of the internet by the Russians, or this alleged weaponization, um, is being, of course, used to fuel a, a Cold War hysteria that's sucking in everybody and sucking in America and is 
Um, being used as a as 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 a, as a reason for why America must confront Russia on some in some kind of capacity, and what that means, of course, uh, we don't we uh, we can, you can only imagine in our in our worst nightmares what that what, what that confrontation would really mean. Um, two nuclear powers over over something that is. I mean, if, if the claims are true, it's worse than it's 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 both uh, the Pearl Harbor. It's pro, both Pearl Harbor and 9/11. So, if it's true, maybe it's worth it. But we'll we'll look at those claims uh, when we get there. Now, <clears throat> fears of Russia corrupting the internet and of, and of using it and of weaponizing it and bending it to its will to influence people. Um, this 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 fear and this and this uh, belief hasn't gone away. But it, um, briefly, it's been supplanted by another uh, scandal on the internet. Um, by the Facebook and, and Cambridge Analytica scandal. Now there's a new, um, a new boogeyman that is being used to explain why Donald Trump was elected, why people voted for him. And so people are freaked out and believe that this shady company uh, was able to, through accessing uh, the Facebook uh, profiles of 50 million uh, people, was able to use that data to construct these really complex psychological profiles uh, of American voters, and then use that data to, to construct a psychological weapon that they zombified the American electorate with, right, through Facebook data, and then use that zombification to get them to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, and, you know, and so, you know, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook have been, become at the center of, it, of, of, of political attention uh, in the past several weeks. And of course, there were the Senate, hearing, uh, Senate hearings where Zuckerberg was grilled for, for, five, for what, four or five hours by uh, senators who didn't really, who uh, seemed to be really into talking about how, how much they loved Facebook and how much they loved using <laughs> Facebook, but not about, you know, little else. Um, about what was wrong about what Facebook was doing. Uh, yeah, Facebook was taken advantage of by a company called Cambridge Analytica. Oh. I think that's what that's what happened. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, sorry. So, um, There's nothing has to do with what sort of candidate Hillary Clinton uh, was or what the Democratic Party is. Yeah. Exactly. And so watching the hearing, you think that until Cambridge Analytica came along to corrupt Facebook and to steal its data, surveillance never happened on the internet, influence never happened on the internet, psychological profiling never happened on the internet. That no one in power had used the internet ever to try to sway people. This is the sense that you get from watching uh, Senate hearings. Um, and that's where I want to start with, uh, because this is something. This is a history of the. This is this flies in the face of the, of the real history of the internet. Didn't it start as a military? Uh, we'll get to that. Get to that. You're uh, you're an eager you're an eager one. <laughs> Um, it's, yeah, we, we maybe we can share the, the podium. Next time. Um, there will be a question and answer period. Maybe people could let Yasha. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's all right. It's more like a. Thanks. Um, yeah. So so, all of this that's that's happened makes makes you think that surveillance and influence something that was just new that appeared on the internet. Something that. Um, was brought in by these corrupting forces, uh, these forces that were either tied to a foreign government that wants to undermine America, or tied to these really other uh, forces that are tied, connected to Donald Trump and who want to install him as, as president. So Robert Mercer, the funder of Cambridge Analytica, the scary New York uh, hedge fund billionaire, libertarian uh, li billionaire. Um, and it's this idea that is... Um, you know, and, and this outrage and, and this belief is really um, based on a deeply flawed premise that exists in, in our culture today. Uh, it's this idea that there was ever a point, that there was a point in the Internet's history when it wasn't used as a weapon, right? It's the idea that until Russia and Trump came along, the Internet was about democracy, it was about egalitarianism, it was about all, all that was good and proper in this world. And, but that tattoo got corrupted. Um, but of course, this idea, this, this myth, this cultural myth, is exactly a myth. Um, the idea and notion that the internet is some kind of magical democracy machine is just not true. Uh, the truth is that the internet has always been a tool of 
surveillance and influence. Um, that's what it was designed to do going back to the 1960s when it was designed by ARPA, the R&D uh, wing of the Pentagon that we know now as DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, the internet, back then known as the ARPANET, uh, was designed to be a weapon of surveillance and influence uh, back then. And it remains a weapon of surveillance and influence today, vastly more powerful in its privatized and commercial form than anyone back then in the 1960s could have imagined. Um, yet this history of the internet as surveillance uh, technology and as a technology of influence today has largely been forgotten. Uh, and for years we've been sold this myth about the utopian and democratic origins of the internet. It's been a very clever and extremely successful marketing campaign by Silicon Valley. Over the past several decades, uh, this industry, aided by think tanks, journalists, and pundits, has done the seemingly impossible. They've uh, managed to rebrand a military technology that had been privatized to, to the into the hands of a small number of corporations into something democratic and egalitarian. It's been rebranded into something almost magical, a tool that will make the world better and freer in every possible way. Um, you know, I, I, the reason I, 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 this stuff uh, resonates so much with me is because I remember these promises well um, from my youth. I was born in the Soviet Union and my family ended up in San Francisco um, at the height of the dot-com boom. Right, I mean, not at the height, right as it was about to take off. Um, we were political refugees uh, who were, had fled a utopia that had failed. Communism, the dream was dead. And as we were leaving it, it was turning into a privatized nightmare, uh, an oligarchy, uh, and a pretty uh, destroyed society. It was in ruins. But in San Francisco, on our arrival, we found out that a, union, <clears throat> that a new utopia was at hand, that technology and the internet would solve all the world's problems. All, it would bring into being everything that communism could not. Hunger, poverty, corruption, all this would be banished from the world, banished from the world. And all of these things would be uh, replaced by a new kind of economy, a new kind of, kind of common economy that, that's powered by network technology and a new progressive capitalism based on technological progress and network, information networks. Um, but as we quickly found out, the dream that the internet promised didn't pan out. Today, America is less equal than it was 30 years ago when we came to America. Uh, there's more poverty, less democracy, more homelessness. Uh, people are, are uh, dying faster, living shorter lives. Um, and the internet, of course, it's not, it's not democratic itself either. Um, it birthed the most powerful corporations and uh, today, it uh, gave rise to some of the most, uh, some of the richest, the most powerful individuals that are alive today. Um, and despite its seemingly chaotic exterior, uh, the internet, it's owned by corporations. Um, it's dominated by companies like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, eBay, Netflix. You can go down the line. IBM, Microsoft even. Um, you know, we use the internet for everything. It mediates our lives more and more and more. Uh, but we have no real power there. We have no more power on the internet than we do if we go to a Walmart uh, food court. You can go in there. You can buy stuff. There'll be, you know, a security guard will watch you, but you can be kicked out at any moment for any reason. And that's the internet. It is, it is Walmart's food court. Um, and Walmart's food court is not a utopia, although it might seem like it sometimes. Um, um, of course, you know, the internet uh, um, did not lead to utopia. 
it created something very much the opposite. It created a, a, a corporate network that mediates modern life and where corporations and governments track our every move. The internet is owned by giant corporations and it is used by giant corporations. It's used by giant corporations, it's used by governments, it's used by intelligence agencies, uh, it's used by political campaigns, it's used by brands, um, and it's used to uh, watch us and to influence us. That's how Silicon Valley makes money, by watching us and influencing us and selling that influence to, to people who want to pay for that influence. Um, so what happened? What, where, did our, where did we go wrong in our understanding of the internet? How did it go from a democratic, utopian technology into what it is today? A technology of influence and surveillance. Um, to understand the internet and to understand where we went wrong, uh, we have to go back to the beginning. Uh, we have to go back to the 1960s when the internet was first created. Back then, America was a uh, still young uh, and rapidly ex expanding empire, global empire. Um, it was facing down the Soviet Union in the Cold War. It was also facing insurgencies all across the world. Uh, it was, the Vietnam War was central, but there were conflicts, uh, similar kinds of conflicts all around the world, from Southeast Asia to Latin America. Uh, America was also facing an increasingly turbulent and violent domestic situation. Um, there was the anti-war movement, powerful left-wing um, organizations uh, and movements. There were civil rights and, um, and militant black activism. There were race riots in, in inner cities. Uh, there were groups like the Weather Underground setting off bombs almost every day. Um, at the time, America's paranoid generals, they looked at what was going on in America and abroad, and they saw a vast communist conspiracy, naturally. Uh, and of course, that's probably, uh, they're probably justified by the fact that we have a sickle, a hammer and sickle uh, holla just sitting somewhere over there, steaming. Um, I mean, maybe they were onto something. Um, so, you know, they looked at these, all this stuff that was happening all across the world, and, and right here in America, and they saw a war that was happening. Uh, and they, um, they saw Soviet, the Soviet Union that was expanding globally and at the same time underwriting communist and left-wing movements all across the globe and in America as well in, in the hopes of undermining America from within. They looked at this and they saw a new kind of war that was happening. This is not a traditional war that you could send a tank division into. It's not something you could drop bombs onto although some people wish to do that in, in the military. Because these new kinds of wars um, involved combat, involved soldiers, but these soldiers didn't wear uniforms. They didn't march in formation. Uh, they were part of the civilian population in which they lived and operated. Uh, whether here in America uh, or abroad uh, or in the jungles of Vietnam, um, these fighters, as they saw them, blended in with their local, the local population. They were part of the people. Um, so the question, there was this, generals were faced with a, with, a, with a question, who are these people? How do we find and isolate the problem population from the complacent population? How do we know what makes these insurgents tick? Why are they rebelling? Why are they against us? Um, and in certain rarefied military circles at the time, it was believed that the only way to fight this new kind of war, this insurgency, this global insurgency, um, was to develop a new kind of weapon, a, a computer-based information weapon, hmm. technology that could um, intercept communications, collect intelligence, ingest data on people and political movements, and analyze that data in sophisticated ways and run computer simulations. Um, the idea was to be able to sift through mountains of data to find the enemy, um, all while giving the military kind of global view of the world. An information-based weapon that could give the military man better management capability of, of a global empire. Um, and at the time, this was revolutionary, or seen as revolutionary. Because you have to remember that uh, back then, in the 1960s, computers were still, for the most part, these giant uh, 
machines that took up entire rooms. Um, a mini computer was, was about the size of a large refrigerator, you know. Um, and so, you know, these were giant pieces of equipment that had to be programmed by punch cards or by um, specially trained technicians. And they would run one program at a time and would give you a result, like a giant complicated calculator. This is not a, this is not a computer that you could run a modern empire with, right? General purpose, easy to use computers, you know, the kinds of computers that we all use today with keyboards, with monitors, with software and, and programs that, you, that anyone could use, um, did not exist. Uh, nor did, um, you know, general uh, networking technology that could connect any kind of computer and have them communicate with each other. These things just did not exist. And so the idea was to create this technology, and that's where, that, that was the task assigned to ARPA, the R&D wing of the Pentagon. Um, and out of this effort emerged the ARPANET, the first version of the internet. And in the 1960s, even as ARPA built the underlying technology uh, that would power this new global uh, military, global military command system, um, there were people involved in the project that were already thinking on a bigger level. They were thinking of the future. Um, and they dreamed of a global system of management a network computer system that could sit on top of the world and watch it in real time and hopefully intercept threats before they could even occur. It would watch the world, see where the problems, is and problems are, and hopefully allow military planners to intervene before they got out of hand. Uh, in much the same way, they envisioned this uh, system in much the same way that a, um, someone would be sitting at a, at a radar uh, display and, and watching a radar screen and, and uh, intercept um, hostile aircraft before they could hit their target. So they were envisioning an early warning radar system for human societies. And that wasn't too far-fetched at the time uh, because already at, uh, in the 1950s America began to develop its first early warning computer-based uh, radar system. It was called SAGE and it cost more than the Manhattan Project to develop. And it was it featured these giant IBM computers connected to radar arrays uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, and SAGE, what it allowed was it allowed a, a analyst sitting at a, at a computer terminal with a little screen that, to watch you know, a huge chunk of the American border thousands of miles away. Um, and once you can do that automatically, once you're able to see that in action, once you can reduce a giant part of America to just a computer display and watch threats as they appeared on, 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 all over this territory. Um, it was not hard to make the leap. Why not do the same thing for people? Why can't we watch people the way that we watch airplanes? Why can't we watch political movements the same way we watch airplanes, hostile airplanes? And of course, the technology did not yet exist, but they saw that this was just the next logical step and they wanted to build it. And this is where the internet came out of. Um, one uh, ARPA contractor, uh, this interesting guy named Ethilda Solopool, who would played a, played a prominent role in the early development of the internet, and also was one of the first people to use computer modeling to um, um, shape uh, elections and to run election strategy. Um, he was a big uh, proponent of this kind of global system of surveillance and management. And in fact, he saw secrecy, the fact that something can escape a technocratic manager like him as the biggest impediment to world peace and stability. So he saw these left-wing upheavals of the 1960s in America as not like a political problem, but as a managerial and technical problem. Um, something that can be managed out, the, the quirks of the system can be managed out if you, have, if you can catch them in time. And so he was a big proponent of this kind of system and he was part of a set of people that were pushing for this. Um, so that a system that could leave nothing hidden from, from managers like himself. Um, if you know everything, you can stop the violence and the revolutions before they get out of hand. Seems like a pretty legitimate you know, uh, dream, I think. You know? Um, you know, but, so there's this dark counterinsurgency history to the origin of the internet. Uh, yet this part of the history of the internet has been obscured and forgotten and replaced by the syrupy myths about democracy and about egalitarianism. 
But the origins of the internet as a technology of surveillance and control uh, were very obvious to people back then, to the people in the 1960s and 1970s uh, when this technology was first being created. Um, back then, the culture of America was very different. People didn't see computers as tools of liberation or tools of, eman of personal emancipation. They saw them as tools of political power and political control and tools that could allow power to centralize their power even more and to exercise it more effectively. And there was a widespread fear <clears throat> in mainstream culture back then that these systems would be both used by both corporations and governments to control society. Um, and the anti-war anti movement in the 1960s targeted um, computer and networking research on campuses all across the country. And that specifically included the ARPANET, the network that would become the internet. And so, you know, one incredible episode that I discovered researching this book, an episode that is completely missing from every history of the internet that I've ever read, and I've read pretty much most of them, um, <clears throat> was that in 1969, the Students for a Democratic Society uh, organized a series of protests at MIT and Harvard <coughs> against the ARPANET, the internet. So, and they organized it in September of 1969. The ARPANET only went online in October of 1969. So they, they were protesting it a month before the first ARPANET link was activated between UCLA and Stanford. And they, um, you know, they produced a, a booklet and flyers talking about why they opposed it and wh why they thought that this technology was dangerous. And they spelled it out very clearly, um, much more clearly than you'll hear, uh, than you heard at the, at the Senate hearings with Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, they saw this network uh, in very clear terms as as a start of a, of a kind of a pu hybrid public-private surveillance network huh. that um, if allowed to expand unchecked and to progress unchecked would create um, a system of surveillance control uh, that would be used primarily to target progressive and left-wing movements. And they called it you know, computerized people manipulation is what they called the, 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 the function of the ARPANET, 1969. And of course they were right. <clears throat> they turned out to be right. Um, and it, they didn't even have to be, wait very long to be proven right. Because as it turned out a few years later, um, in 1972, just a few years after um, the ARPANET was activated and when it started to go national, um, the network was used to spy on Americans. Um, it was used um, to help the CIA, the NSA, and uh, the U.S. Army to transfer um, millions of uh, surveillance files that had been illegally collected by the U.S. Army huh. and to share that among um, intelligence agencies and, uh, and government organizations. Um, it was essentially what appeared to be a, a, a test run of exactly uh, what the ARPANET was designed to do, which was that to allow government agencies, intelligence agencies, military agencies, to share data amongst themselves and to analyze data to process data, to work with data, um, and to do so in a way that hadn't uh, been achieved before because most surveillance data was not digitized. It was sitting in, uh, it, was, it was on paper or on, on micro, uh, microfilm uh, or IBM punch cards. It could not be easily shared. You'd have to share it, you'd have to send it in the mail if you wanted to share it with an intelligence agency. The ARPANET um, <clears throat> allowed intelligence agencies to immediately share data with each other. And to access, you don't even have to send it. You can just access their 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 uh, their data banks, the, you know, thousands of miles away. And so, um, this was in 1972 that that millions of surveillance files of, of an American uh, protesters, anti-war protesters, civil rights protesters, and uh, anti-poverty protesters uh, was digitized on the ARPANET and 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 made available on the ARPANET to intelligence agencies. Um, and this was. Uh, the story, the fact that this happened, was broken by a, an NBC uh, correspondent in 1975. And <clears throat> it's as strange as it is, they were talking about ARPANET and surveillance in 1975 on, on, on NBC News, uh, on, on TV. And uh, talking about this network as a surveillance network, talking about it as a danger to democracy, because um, the big uh, innovation at the time was that everyone was afraid of big centralized government databases. That's what people were focused on at the time. 
But what people, what people, what freaked people out about the ARPANET was that it showed that you didn't need a giant centralized database to store everybody's files. All you needed was a network to connect a bunch of little databases. And those databases could be, you know, trivial. They didn't need that much money to be developed. And went later. I have to wait till the Sure. Or he will scold me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just um, want to know the name of the journalist. I'll, I'll tell you. And he's, <laughs> he, he's still alive. He's still alive, actually. So. Oh. Um, <clears throat> um, and so it was a big scandal at the time. Huge scandal. Uh, it led the, uh, the um, primetime news, evening news, for three days straight. Uh, and it uh, uh, resulted in the congressional investigations of uh, government surveillance technology. Um, so, 1975, surveillance on the internet uh, was talked about in mainstream culture, written about in the uh, biggest uh, newspapers and, and magazines uh, in our country here. Um, and yet, that episode has disappeared down the memory hole. Um, until I discovered it, no book on the history of the internet had mentioned it. Mm. You wouldn't know about it at all. Um, and so the book that I wrote <clears throat> um, attempts to, just to uh, recover some of this lost history. Right? Um, um, and you know, it's important for us to know this lost history, um, not just from a historical perspective, not just because uh, we want to know what happened, so that we'll know what happened. Um, it's important because you can draw a straight line from the origins of the internet, from the counterinsurgency origins of the internet, the military origins of the internet, um, to the internet that we all use today. It helps us understand what Google, what Facebook, what Cambridge Analytica um, are all about. <clears throat> and that these things are not something that's new, but they're part of the reason that this network was created. Um, and <clears throat> we have to understand that surveillance and influence is something that is very fundamentally a part of the internet, of, the of computer technology. It is built into its DNA. Um, and it's not a very uh, happy story because the internet surrounds us and we feel kind of powerless against it. Um, but it is, uh, Yet, if we are going to try to democratically reclaim this technology and in the future try to steer its development somehow, that it works for people, not for giant corporations, we have to deal with this past. We have to know it. We have to understand it. And we have to incorporate it into our thinking. We can't think of the Internet as some kind of you know, airy-fairy kind of thing that exists out there. We have to be very specific about what it is and where it comes from. Um, we have to face it and we have to understand it, um, no matter how dark or unpleasant or kind of uncomfortable that, that history is. Um, I don't know how we are on time, but I could, re I could read a little, I could, uh, I could just read a quick one. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll like this part, I think. <laughs> I don't know why I'm <clears throat> losing my voice. There's water right there. Oh, thank you. I have read book. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I can make it through. Just a couple of pages. <clears throat> on June 2nd, 1975, NBC correspondent Ford Rowan oh. appeared on the evening news to report a stunning expose. Baby faced with light blue eyes, he spoke straight into the camera and told viewers that the military was building a sophisticated, computer communications network and was and was using it to spy on Americans and share quote our sources say the army's information on thousands of American protesters has been given to the CIA and some of it is in the CIA computers now we don't know who gave the order to copy and keep the files what we do know is that once the files are computerized the defense department's new technology makes it incredibly easy to move information from one computer to another Rowan reported Quote, this new network links computers to the CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, and more than 20 universities and a dozen research centers, like the RAND Corporation. Rowan had spent months pie piecing the story together. And for three days after the initial report, he and his colleagues at NBC um, aired several more news segments looking more closely at this mysterious surveillance network and the shadow agency that had built it. 
uh, quote, the key, the key breakthrough in this, in this new computer technology was made at a, was made at a little known unit of the, de of the de <coughs> excuse me, of the Defense Department, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA. ARPA scientists created something new in computer communications with this device. It's known as the IMP, the Interface Message Processor. Di <coughs> different computers communicate in different computer languages. Before the IMP, it was enormously difficult. Huh. In, in many cases, impossible to link the various computers. The IMP, in effect, translates all computer messages into a common language. That makes it very, very easy to tie them into a network. This means that from computer terminals now in place at the White House, the CIA, or the Pentagon, an official can push a button and get whatever information there might be on you and the FBI's vast computer files. These files include records from local police agencies, which are hooked into the FBI by computer. Rowan's expose was phenomenal. It was based on solid sources from the Pentagon, the CIA, and the Secret Service, as well as key ARPANET insiders, some of whom were concerned about the creation of a network that could so seamlessly link multiple government surveillance systems. In the 1970s, the historical significance of the ARPANET was not yet apparent. Yet what Rowan uncovered has become only more relevant in hindsight. It would take more than 20 years for the internet to spread into most American homes, and four decades would pass before Edward Stone's leaks made the world aware of the massive amount of government surveillance happening over the internet. Today, people still think that surveillance is something foreign to the internet, something imposed on it from the outside by paranoid government agencies. Rowan's reporting from 40 years ago tells a different story. It shows how the military and intelligence agencies that used the network to spy on Americans in the first version of the internet. In other words, surveillance was baked in from the very beginning. That's it. Yes. Um, you talked about how it's now, I mean, actually, how did it go from government, um, you know, control to private control, and when about did that happen? Um, it was privatized. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a convoluted story, it's, but it's, put, to put simply, was, uh, there was an intermediate network called the NSF, the NSFNet, right. the National Science Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, um, it was funded by the government, by the National Science Foundation, and it was and it was created with the uh, with the ultimate goal of privatizing it. it was actually, the structure of it was such that it was made for privatization. It was it was a government funded, publicly funded network, national network with a national backbone and regional internet service providers that were funded by the government, but they were but they were administered and built by nonprofit corporations, and then those nonprofit corporations were allowed to form for-profit divisions and then transfer the assets essentially from the non-profit to the pro-profit divisions and then to seek a commercial clients. And so that's how it happened. So there was an intermediate sort of research network between the military and uh, the, the, the commercial internet that we know now as you know, the internet. It was the NSF net, but it, was all, but it was designed and built by many of the same people who were involved in creating the ARPANET, the military network. So um, uh, this was... From the from the mid '80s to to the to the to 1995, I think is when um, um, the NSF net was finally fully privatized and the government got out of it. So, yeah, and there was this was not there was not like any there wasn't like a you know there wasn't any debate about this really not 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 no public debate really about the the privatization of this network. Yeah, but. I, I just want to mention the last season of the AMC TV show um, Halt and Catch Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, actually dealt with NSFnet completely apolitically, of course. Yes. You know, it was just, oh, we have this nice research network that is going to become something that we think will become like the internet. That's cool. Huh? Um, and Al Gore is, uh, was actually mentioned in that because apparently he was the senator who was pushing uh, that at the time in, in Congress. Yeah, he got funding for it, yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned the, the, the original conception of it was uh, to, to monitor the world and to look at ways of intervening. And of course, a lot of the, the media coverage here and the Russia phobia and the xenophobia suggests that Russia tampers with elections, but the US and the CIA have a long history of tampering in elections. And you know, I certainly have been skeptical during events like the Arab Spring when the use of the internet and cell phones was hailed particularly with the suspicions of false flag kind of operations and things about 
events in, say, Libya or Syria and the movements against Gaddafi and Assad. I'm wondering, in your research, if you've run across any ways in which American intelligence is perhaps using the internet to interfere with uh, other governments. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I think, you know, I don't think it's even questioned. Yes, look, uh, for instance, uh, um, take, there's a, you know, American intervention in, over the internet is just, is part of the actual design of the internet almost. So like you take, let's say, something like the Tor Project. Um, you know, it's the, the sort of the underpins of the dark web. That is a gover U.S. government funded technology. The U.S. government funds it still today, even though it's supposed to protect you from the U.S. government, this, this, this dark web tool. The Tor Project is very specifically a tool of intervention and uh, a, a tool of American power projected over the internet because what it's des why the U.S. government funds it is because it's when countries like China or Iran want to kind of clamp down on their national internet border and want to say like, no, we don't want you know, outside interference in our affairs. And they kind of do this firewall against around their country. The Tor Project is designed to act like a digital crowbar that prevents uh, foreign governments from, from, from controlling their digital border. And so the, the existence of this technology in its, is itself already a, um, a, meddling, a case of meddling. And for instance, when I, I was able to get a lot of files uh, from, via FOIA on communication between Tor Project and uh, one of its main government funders, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which runs America's sort of foreign, pro foreign broadcasting, foreign bro uh, propaganda division. Okay. Um, um, you know, they, there, they were discussing a plan called the Russia Deployment Plan that they wanted to uh, make sure that <clears throat> the Tor Project and the browser would be the menus would be translated into Russian, that it would be localized, because they wanted to release it into Russian before the, the, the elections, uh, presidential elections, just, just, you know, just to make sure that everything was okay, just to, empower, just to give people powers. And, and so the idea is like, what I read into that, there was no even censorship in Russia at the time. Um, there was no internet censorship. There was not a system of, of actually censoring it, websites like there is actually now in Russia. Um, but it was like a kind of a, almost a psychological sort of poke, you know, because you make people, you make foreign governments paranoid because you're suddenly injecting these kinds of yeah, tools yeah, that yeah. suddenly are supposed to thwart their own power, you know, in, in within their own borders, and you and you're and you're deploying them through um, through um, um, things like Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, which is a, which is itself a radio station that was created by the CIA to meddle in, in foreign countries, you know through psychological warfare and uh, radio programs. Um, so I mean, that's just, that's just an example of you, just, you know, the dark web is a meddling, is, is for meddling. And of course, there's other ones, you know, there's the crazy idea that, um, where USAID uh, wanted to create a, a fake Twitter clone in Cuba, um, and, and, and over, t over text messaging, hopefully getting, sort of getting people to, you know, uh, join this network and then hoping to send political messages that were um, you know, getting people to rise up against against uh, their country, and of course that was a giant failure, and it just cost millions of dollars, and it went nowhere, and because um, it was exposed uh, by Cuba, and it was just kind of a ridiculous thing that didn't work. But it happens all the time, um, and telecommunications and the internet is, are used by um, you know all the time to uh, by by the by the U.S. government, obviously, to destabilize foreign countries. I mean, I know that you know you talk about false flags and things like that. I mean, what's interesting to me is not like whether or not, you know, the U.S. government would stage something and then film it and then try to convince people to, um, you know, back some kind of intervention, like maybe in Syria or in Libya. What's interesting to me about that is that even with the Internet, right, we have, the Internet is supposed to, information is supposed to make us more informed. It's supposed to make us wiser, it's supposed to make us better consumers, you know, citizens, citizen consumers, because we can have a lot more information going to our brain and we can then choose the, you know, make our own minds up about the world and because you know it's a lack of information that is preventing us from 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 making better choices but what happened you know Syria for instance you know with the chemical attack chemical attacks and immediate uh, immediate footage that comes out of that you don't know where it's really coming from you don't know what the hell is going on you know you just have a YouTube video it could be true it could be not true uh, and so it's like you don't really know that thing you have you have more and more information and it's coming to, at you immediately you know, like that from Syria. It would never have happened before. 
But the internet and YouTube, it's like boom, it comes, it hits your brain. But it does not make us more informed. In fact, it, what it does is make us less informed. Because we have no idea. We can't judge for ourselves. So we have to trust um, the, the people who are bringing that to us. We have to trust institutions that are filtering this for us. So if, uh, do, do people trust CNN? Do people trust MSNBC? Do people trust the New York Times? Do people trust Fox News? Um, n not really, you know. I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of distrust in, in uh, our culture of, uh, with that, and, and I think, you know, bypassing them <laughs> and giving us the raw footage from some kind of chemical attack or some kind of attack somewhere half around the, halfway around the world. I mean, it's 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 it doesn't give us information. It's almost uh, the, it's the opposite. And so um, I don't know. I feel like it's I don't know if it's you know. Uh, it's not even a conspiracy, I think, but like just the, the, the fact is that what the internet has shown us is like total information awareness does not equal wisdom, does not equal knowledge or understanding. And we have now total information awareness, it seems like. And we have, I think, less and less understanding what the hell is going on in the world than we've ever, we've ever had. And I'm, as a journalist, I just, I, have, I struggle to deal with the information overload. And because everything has to be triple checked and quadruple checked, and sometimes it can't be checked at all. And so, um, and there's, it's coming at you, you always with incredible immediacy. And so it's like almost, a, it's very disorienting and, um, and that in itself is almost a weapon of a sort because it, par it paralyzes you. To, 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 to have you watch them as, as much as possible, to have you interact with them as, as, as long as possible. And uh, to, because platforms like Facebook and Google make their money but with, you know, through user engagement. And so they want you to be on that platform for as long as possible because they want you to click on those ads and they want to get those eyeballs on, on videos, you know, so they can make the money. So the, 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 the business um, incentives uh, that's sort of built into these platforms and uh, how these platforms make money, I mean, already are about uh, get, uh, engaging us, right? And, um, and um, but you know, so there's multiple levels to it. So on the one hand, you can have Facebook just doing that and no one cares about, you know, no one, no one's spying on us necessarily. The, the, the government doesn't really care about you, but but that's but it's always there, you know. So there's always the potential for that. Um, I mean, the internet isn't some kind of like you know vast go government conspiracy. Um, it just it just it's not even hidden from us really. It's just uh, it's there if you want to look at it. If you it's not the, the archives are open to all of us. You can you, know, you can go and find it as I did so, some of these things uh, at MIT, uh, Stanford. Um, and um, so no, I mean I, I think that like you know it's uh, I'm not sure if, I, if that answers your question, but um, but I think. It, yeah. Well, do you personally use social media, the internet, and so on? What do you, oh, hell yeah. do you say about? It? <laughs> 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 oh man. Um, uh, yeah, I, look, yes, I use it because I think it's first as, as an independent journalist. As a, you know, like I can't not use it. I, I, there's, I don't have a. It's the only way that I kind of interact with people who, who read me. It's, it's, I, 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 it's, I interact with, with colleagues around the world. I, um, even the people who I'm not, you know, direct. I don't necessarily directly or personally know very well, but we know sometimes we know each other a little bit. We, we, we connect with each other, you know, through Facebook and through Twitter. I use it, of course, all the time. I, I try to limit the, uh, my, the amount of engagement that I, that, I, that I have on there and the amount of time I spend there because it's extremely addictive. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, it's really in, in, insane, actually. Uh, especially when I had to, like, when I released the book and I kind of had to be on Facebook a little bit, you know, to promote it a little bit to get people to buy it. And as soon as I started engaging with it, the more I engaged with it, the more I couldn't step away from it because you just, I, just, it, it, I, I saw it so, so clearly because I... I stepped away from, from it or limited my interaction with it uh, in the months before right, because I was busy writing, writing and doing other things. I was, was, was rarely on social media, but like I saw that, that change. Is, is, is the more you engage with it, the more, the more you can pull out of it. Look, all this stuff about surveillance, which I think you know, you're, you're probably your question is geared more towards surveillance and influence and, um, and what happens to our data and the fact, like, what kind of power do we, do we have on these platforms? I mean, I, don't, I think it's the wrong um, suggestion to pull out or to like, you know, delete Facebook or delete the app. Because I think that, because if we, I mean, you, you almost have to kind of leave society to some degree, modern society. Uh, now, uh, you, and you can li live like a hermit, 
uh, and because a lot of your friends are on there, your family is on there. So it's it's the modern telephone. It's the modern mail system. People don't write letters to each other anymore. We communicate through these platforms, and so you'd be like telling someone, it's like, well, the FBI could spot, could read your mail, so don't send mail anymore, send letters anymore. You know, when there was no telephone, let's say, when there was no. They computer. actually did read your mail, actually. What's that? No, I know that, but, but you're saying so instead of say, instead of getting the FBI to stop reading your mail, or sort of, let's say it's like say, oh no, the Koch brothers read your mail, so don't send mail anymore through the through the, through the post service. It's like, no, we should just get the Koch brothers out of your mailbox, you know? Like, it's, and, and that's basically what it is. I think the, the, the solution to this is not technological, which is, you know, dropping one app and then installing another app, but actually political. And so, and that it's, in, it's within the power of our society to regulate and to, to set rules for what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, right? And, and, so, and so I think the, 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 the challenge, this is very challenging because it's not about just downloading something and you know, deleting something and, uh, and downloading something else, but it's actually about building political movements around this and, and making it a, a political issue, probably embedding it in a, in a bigger political movement because I think the issue of privacy you know, pales in comparison to the issue of, I don't know, uh, health care uh, or the, uh, the issue of uh, access to housing and access to, to food and to, to nutritious food and to, and to all these things and to uh, access to jobs and, and, and decent wages, right? I mean, it's all, they're all connected in a way. Uh, but like, but it as, a, as an issue on its own, privacy and surveillance is never going to pass. The, I think it's it's important that we need to discuss it, but it needs to be part of some kind of larger political move where we restrict the power that these companies have over the internet, and we also, you know, restrict the power that governments have over that data as well. It's not easy. It hasn't never been easy. But that's hope that answers your question. Yep. Um. So, like, thinking about how you know it's not a vast conspiracy and. And uh, you know, obviously, don't quit the internet because that will fix anything. But like, since it started the way it did, and now we're you know within the context of capitalism and and how much of it has been privatized, to what extent are things like orchestrated? Like, are, is it safe to assume that a lot of us probably think that activism over the internet is really effective? But can it be effective? You know, yeah. I mean, like, is it safe to assume that if something seems effective, that maybe they, whoever, you know, allowed it to be effective, or? I don't know. I think it's going a little far. I mean, I think probably act activism over the internet is not effective at all. Yeah. I mean, as a component of activism, is, is probably good, like just like any other kind of organizing. Mm -hmm. But internet activism is, you know, it's like it's 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 ephemeral. It's it's you need actual political groups, actual political organizations, humans knowing each other in real life and building deep. Networks that can withstand, you know, just someone, you know, shutting down Facebook mm -hmm. or whatever, or blocking your Facebook group, and all of a sudden, you know, there it goes, you know, there goes your political movement, you know. Uh, so I think, I think again, I don't think it's we shouldn't get into this conspir conspiratorial thinking about like that everything is is set up because well, look, it's you can walk out, you know, you're not, you're not you don't you're not the, the your computer screen isn't glued to your face just yet, you know. You, you can like you can like step out of step away from it and see the world around you, right? So sure. it's not like you're not totally living in a, in a simulation just yet, you know. Yeah, and I know that it can be used for like the right ways or whatever. But like I think about that quote, like if voting changed anything, they would make it illegal. Like is it? They did have to make it illegal. To the internet, like well, yeah, right. you know, That's if the, the internet could change anything, wouldn't they make it illegal? I guess. Well, it was illegal. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Voting rights act. So, sir, maybe somewhat similar lines. Like, so, you know, the the internet. This, you know, the internet started as this military project of surveillance. It's been privatized, and because of you know, you know, because of really some bullshit like Cambridge Analytica and the Russian trolls or anything like that. Suddenly, states, state powers are reacting. You have the U.S. You know, hauling in you know Zuckerberg, the EU bringing him in. Um, you know, looking like a deer in the headlights and really robotic, but um, but like asking him these pointed questions and starting to talk about regular, you know, regulatory, you know, uh, apparatuses to, to control these things. But uh, that seems that seems limited. It doesn't get to the it doesn't get to the, the core of the of you know of the problem. Um, and then on, on the, sort of on the other end of things, you have you know sort of these crass like comments about how like oh we'll just nationalize Facebook we'll just na uh, we'll we'll just simply nationalize uh, Uber and all these different all these different platforms and stuff like that but it nationalize you yeah 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 it, it, yeah it just isn't but it just, there's no there's no context to that to that sort of that that push 
So I'm wondering, like, what is the what what is the in between between yeah. the, these 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 flimsy these flimsy regulations that are being discussed and and the sort of aspirational but contextless like you know nationalizing project? Yeah, I I, I think the the fundamental problem that underlies both of those things that you described is our actually a lack of imagination and lack of um, uh, political. Uh, um, a lack of a politics for technology. So we, we, we don't even know what like a technology or an internet that is democratic, you know, uh, what would it look like? If, if you're going to nationalize the internet, re-nationalize or rationalize aspects of the internet, like, okay, what, what are the institutions, what are the, what are the, who are the people that are actually making policy? What is the policy? Like, what is the vision for a nationalized network? You know, like a nationalized Uber, like who? Because th that these things are still going to have be managed, and they're going to go. There, there's going to be a kind of a. They're going to be developed in, uh, on some, on some path and for some for some reason. We we can't even imagine. I think what's not being discussed, and it's not really that. It's not simple because we have to figure this out. What is, what is a democratic internet? What does it mean to have a democratic internet? What's democratic about it? Like, how can it be used, and how can this, how can this technology be used to make a more democratic world? Um, rather now, I think you're right. I mean, we just talked about like, yeah, we just keep Facebook as it is, and we nationalize it. But but Facebook is, is a very particular kind of platform. It's built for a particular purpose. It's not built for messaging. Actually, it's built for for, for advertising and for for trapping you on in there and for for influencing you. And so, like. That's why I think they don't go far enough, and I think you probably leave you wanting is that okay? And then what? You know, and and how, how? But why and what? Uh, and so I, I, but that fits into another problem is like what is a, a society, a modern technological society that is democratic, and that what does it even look like? What are the institutions? Uh, the, it's easy to, you know, want, you know, like medical, having you know free uh, free healthcare for all or uh, free education. These things are hard to accomplish, but at least they're easy to envision because, well, it's just an extension of something that we have already, already or other countries have, have it already. And, but a, dem a, a, a nationalized internet or a democratic internet is very hard to imagine because it's never been dem democratic. It's always been driven by two things. It's been driven by national security interests and it's been driven by Wall Street, so the profit motive. And these are the, these are the two powers that have defined the way that this technology looks and the way that we interact with it and that and, and they shape that technology and then that technology shapes us and then we shape it back and so and but those forces are the only ones that are active right now there's there are no democratic forces democratic organizations democratic ideas that are working on this technology that are working to impact it in any way in meaningful way so that it actually impact its development and its trajectory so I mean, that's the fundamental thing is that like these there's no democracy on the internet there's no democracy in the, in the, in the development of technology or in the, in the shaping of the way that it develops because people have no access to it at all we just are we're, we're, we're just users I mean really it's we have as much impact on the internet as we have on Walmart or, um, or the cafeteria yeah well you have your when I was in high school 68 my sociology teacher pointed me to the New York Times which at that time, in that part of my life, it was a very good move because there was a lot of factual reporting yep. in the New York Times, and still is today. Um, you, you envision that there could be a platform for rational discourse uh, set up on the internet. I mean, Wikipedia has certain standards for um, putting a fact, you know, submitting facts that adds to their database, and they, they you know, do you think it's possible? for a platform like that to actually um, entice a lot of people and basically teach people some sort of criterion for rational discourse, because I think that's really what's lacking. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't know, rationality has its, has its you know, it says it's, um, can be over, over I guess. but you know, Wikipedia is something that is, you know, uh, modified by the, by the, by the crowd, or, you know, by its crowdsourced and that in itself is a problem because you know who has who has the time to sit on Wikipedia and and, and, and endlessly debate and and um, 
um, changes, especially to controversial topics. Right. So if you go to Wikipedia on controversial topics, you'll find, the, you'll, you'll find very quickly that the side that gets represented the most is the one that power backs. Uh, and the side that are, are somehow against power have a harder time of getting in there and staying in there because they're, it's constantly changing and people are involved in the debate and the people who have time to spend there are, I don't know why they have so much time. I mean, it is, you know, uh, because they are frequently at work for PR companies. Um, and, uh, and, and their job is to uh, make sure that certain, certain issues are, you know, massaged in a certain way. And so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, yes, there's, I, I, it's a good question. Uh, what, is, what does it mean to have a, 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 a democratic society? Clearly, you're going to need a space that where people can come together and debate ideas. And, um, but that's probably, just having a space like that on, online is probably not going to solve our, you know, our problems. So just to have a rational space to debate stuff. Yep. Um, so aside from Cambridge Analytica and all that, where do like private intelligence or private data companies like Palantir fit into all of this? Because I, like, I see their name every once in a while, but it's unclear what their like product, so to speak, is and who their clients are. Like, what do they actually do? It's a good question. I mean, they provide data services for, to all sorts of clients. They provide platforms to find, to track terrorism. They provide a, a, um, predictive analytics for police departments. They provide services to Wall Street. They provide services to even journalists, apparently, uh, uh, the, uh, to you know to work with data. Um, you know, they are uh, a kind of an advanced. Palantir is this company that promises to take any kind of data and to smash it all together and to get your job done and to find and to analyze it in ways that are beneficial to you, whether you're an uh, intelligence agency, a police department, a Wall Street a hedge fund. Um, so that's what they do. And you know there are a bunch of companies like that. Um, Cambridge Analytica is a very specialized company. Um, it's part of a larger company that's called S SCL Group, which does sort of like um, counterinsur counterinsurgency Influence campaigns um, globally for 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 um, for the military, uh, but also for private clients, and does election work for private clients all around the world, trying to influence uh, elections. Um, you know, uh, the Democratic Party has its own uh, giant uh, uh, data influence organization called uh, PGP Van. I think it's a merger of two uh, two two data companies. Um, you know, the, the Koch brothers have their own called i360 that does pretty much everything that Cambridge Analytica does and actually much more because it actually has a lot more data on American uh, voters. Uh, uh, i360, which is funded by uh, Charles Koch, um, claims to have um, files on over 200 million Americans and each of those files has, you know, hundreds of data points about who they are and what they're in interested in. And they plug into Facebook, they work with Facebook. Um, they work with their, you know, uh, third-party data brokers. They can, you know, isolate, you know, down to down to a particular voter in a particular district with it, with a name and an address, uh, and they can send a, a political campaign uh, worker to their doorstep if they want to get their vote. And so, uh, these things are, uh, you know, uh, influencing people and uh, and managing the world in a predictable manner. That's the holy grail of computer technology. That is the thing that is sort of always out there. That is what the people who are designing these systems have been dreaming about forever. And you, you, you can look at any industry, whether it's election, um, the election industry, data election industry, you can look at Google, you can look at companies like Palantir, you can look at um, the NSA, you can look at, look at the Air Force, you can look at the Army, and they all have their own very various programs um, where they are trying to suck in information about the world uh, and they are trying to influence it in some way. And they have programs that are still in development that promise that, that promise to do even more. And so, um, we live in that in that in that in that world in this in this world. But I think it's not as effective as uh, the people who are building these systems claim they are, if, and and people, and want them to be. I mean, if if data systems were that that effective, Hillary Clinton would be the president right now. Uh, Cambridge Analytica before um, its funder switched to Donald, backing Donald Trump was backing he was backing Ted Cruz. Uh, Cambridge Analytica was working with Cambridge. He didn't. He, he didn't win. You know, and 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 he was working with Facebook actually. So Facebook and Cambridge Analytica 
and, and Robert Mercer were working together to get him elected, to get him to win the primary. <laughs> you, you, if you go to Facebook's uh, business page where they, where they talk about the various campaigns that they were involved in, there's still a page saying, <laughs> the title is, Cruising for a Win. <laughs> and they talk about the successful um, sort of engagement campaign that they had with primary voters, and they were able to increase interest in Ted Cruz by some margin, you know, with Facebook data. And so, um, you know, these things are not as effective as some of these people would like them to be. Uh, and that is a good thing, right, for, from our point of view, um, because, you know, reality matters. Um, and the more that you, f the more that you as a manager are, are plugged into, the, into a model of the world and are not really in interacting with the actual world, and you're designing systems that you think are supposed to help you mirror that world and represent the world, but in a, in a computer model, the more you actually are existing in that model rather than the real world, and you could be completely thrown for a loop in the real world, does something that you don't expect, which is, you know, it would happen to Hillary Clinton. Their models told them that they were going to win and all these things. It didn't happen. And so, um, and they had the best data people. So their idea of the world and their own biases and their own are actually impacting the creation of their own prediction systems. So they're, they're plugging themselves into that as well, not just us. And, um, and so I think there's, it's good to talk about this and to understand what, what's going on and to understand that this is happening every day, no matter where we go. Everything that we do on Facebook, everything that we do on Google, is part of that system because these systems are meant to be platforms that rent out our attention for in, to people who want campaigns to be foreign governments. You know, Twitter went to RT to pitch them. You know, uh, um, uh, you know, a special discount, you know, right for the for the two, 2016 elections. Um, they don't care. They only they only started caring after it became a scandal and it began to. Uh, they were threatened with regulation by. Um, um, but this, the internet is a, is a platform that is built on renting out our attention uh, for the sake of influencing our opinions to the highest bidder. And so we have to understand that, and I think that is a problem. That it, the internet shouldn't be run like that. That is not a power that I think any powerful corporation should have. I think we would care a lot if we would say it wasn't Facebook that was running Facebook, but it was Coke Industries, or if it was Philip Morris, or if it was ExxonMobil, or it was... Chevron, you know, or Enron, you know. If Enron was running Facebook, you know, we'd be, I mean, of course, it, we, we would be, we'd be, we'd be protesting outside of Enron every day, right? And we'd probably be quitting Facebook. But because Facebook has a different image and, and it's been able to sell itself as this do-gooder company that's totally agnostic, totally separate from the world and it has no, it has, you know, it's almost not of the world. It's almost doesn't exist. It's just there to help us, you know, but yet, what it does is it collects uh, information about us, builds profiles, and on, that, on, on, on the basis of those profiles, it uh, allows advertisers to target us for influence. And that is not, a, I think, a, a business model that in a democratic society that should be allowed um, for something as important as, 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 as the internet because it's a very fundamental um, telecommunications network that underlies so much of our, of our lives. And to, ru to give a private company with its own political agenda and its own political interests, access to people's lives, and 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 and, and to get to allow them to build a business model on influencing us, just I don't think is in line with a democratic system. It's pers my personal opinion. I don't know how you feel about it. Well, Go ahead. You know, it, what comes to mind is that um, a, co a corporation like Facebook doesn't have to have any agenda, but the agenda is is making money, and that gives them a certain. It's a big agenda. <laughs> right, right. So they don't have to start with any agenda, but it gives them a certain agenda. It gives them what they want to push for in, in the political realm in this country and other countries. It gives them a lot. You know, it in itself is a huge motivation. Like, and like so, it. so we could forget about you know, I mean, whether they start, whether they're the Koch brothers or their Facebook, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. The reason I bring it up is that it's just there's certain certain images and certain you have a certain idea of a company. Yeah based on what it is, and so we know the corporates are bad. We know that oil right. companies are bad. We know that you know, cigarette companies, tobacco companies are bad. But Facebook, Google, 
They're these right. neutral things. Well, and only only now are, you know, people are beginning to realize that, oh, wait, 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 something's and going we, on. And we need to take that, those thoughts and go beyond that and look at like the Gates Foundation, which is mm -hmm. a really evil yeah. foundation, yeah. but people think they're trying to do good in the world, but they do a lot of bad. Yeah, I mean, it's weird I to have a billionaire, a billionaire. <laughs> but but you, had a you had a question. First, with the capitalist system that we have, how could be otherwise? We're all commodities to them. Yep. And, and everything about us is a commodity, and they want to maximize the profit. Yeah, no, it's true. But, uh, but, but, but the thing about the internet is that, okay, our cultural understanding and, um, of the internet is changing very quickly. Things move suddenly, things turn like this on a dime. And so I think people are beginning to look at the internet much more skeptically, but just a few years ago, if you were to say that, hey, you know, Google is like spying on you, man, you know, they're, yep. you know, you'd have to work really hard to, to get people to even see these companies as capitalist, you know, uh, or that they have some kind of capitalist motive. I'm like, yeah, it's really weird, but it's true. And so, um, and so I agree, and it, because of the successful branding that the that, that Silicon Valley has um, branding campaign that that's been really an incredible, uh, uh, incredible thing. Uh, it's been it's been incredible to see the transformation because from the 1970s to the 1990s, it was just like a total switch in, 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 in people's idea of of what a computer was, and and the people who probably. Like, it's incredible, uh, because I think some people in this room might have maybe been on both sides of that, uh, been both sides of that cultural shift. Um, seeing it as seen as something, computers as something that is, um, you know, a tool of power and a tool of control to a tool of personal liber liberation. And uh, um, um, so I think we're flipping back to that, to that, to the original idea of what a computer is. And that's a good thing. As we look forward, you know, when we have this, this medium of the internet, and we have had this other medium, the television, and, and as you look at those two, and as they merge, and now the internet is television, and television is the internet, mm -hmm. and how, how will that all play out and get manipulated even further, and, and, and change our, our perspectives and our viewpoints, and what we watch, and what they know about. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's yeah, uh, a good question. Now you you get okay. Well, I mean, there's probably going to be an upside. Is that the ad that you're going to watch on TV is going to be directly relevant to you? It's going to be just like you're going to be like, oh yeah, I love it. You know, that's probably the only good thing that'll come out of it. It won't be just like we'll have, but we'll, but then you know, if you have anyone watching TV with you, they'd be like, oh man, this ad sucks. <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the one thing I wanted to mention was... No, 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 oh, sorry, behind you. So you already spoke once. We'll get to you after... Yes. So okay. it seems, considering the, the history of the internet, that it's functioning exactly like it's supposed to, and considering that corporations are controlling it and really don't have a motivation to change it, and politicians don't really have a motivation to change it, what specific changes would you like to see, and how do you see them coming about? Mm. It's a good question. It's a good question, and I I don't think I have an answer for that, you know, because I you know I unfortunately I, I you know like I, I sometimes like to think like we all live in a kind of a, in New York Times editorial, you know, where where if you if you if you bring up a problem, you have to always have like a th you know a, a oh, bullet point bad, of bad. a bullet point of like well here are three steps we can take. I mean, and I wish I had that, you know, because because I I I don't have an answer to that, you know, because I I, I think. It's more fundamental than the internet. Uh, the internet is a reflection of our world. Mm -hmm. right? The internet is dominated by giant corporations. It's dominated by intelligence agencies, by spies, because our society is driven and dominated by these forces. It's that's about as simple as you can put it, right? And so, until you change your society so that it's not dominated by spies and corporations. You're not going to have an internet that's not dominated by them, and so, so you actually have to. You can't start at the internet. The internet is a manifestation of something. It's part of it, but it's not like. The, so you can't. You actually can't piece it out, and so you have to start at something more fundamental, which is a, a general politics of, of every, of everything. You know, of like what do we want our world to look like? What do we want our world to be? And so, and you start from that you know, simple question and work your way up. And I don't have the. This is something that has to be developed 
organically, democratically from some from from the from the culture. You know, it's I, and I would be I think um, I would it would I, it's not even hubris. It's like it just I don't think I have I don't think I have what it what you need to under to, to answer that question. And I think it, it's wrong to send people into some kind of a, you know to give people a sense that oh yeah there are these things you can do con concretely that'll solve the problem because there aren't because you know try to get corporations and spies out of our society. So Good luck. Do you, do you think that could, that the internet could be fixed at all within the context of capitalism? I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's a, uh, look, I mean, you can have an internet in a, in a socialist state and it could be bad and oppressive too. So it's not like, you know, I, look, capitalism, socialism, these things are, you know, they're fundamentally different right, ways of organizing resources and organizing societies, but each of those systems could be used to exploit people and to uh, to hold people down and to and to empower and to empower a certain set of people over others. It's just it's it, every every ideological system can go bad. It's true. You know, I mean, I come from the Soviet Union. It's like that place was not a. I'm not I'm not an anti-communist. You know, I'm actually, but and I'm not an anti-socialist. But like, but I, you have to look at the realities of what can happen and uh, with where there's a there's a certain idea about the world. And there's a reality in how that idea is brought to light. And so I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, whether or not capitalism, you know, can be reformed and to be sort of constrained. It probably can, you know, to some degree. You know, it can be made a little bit nicer, right? <laughs> um, it's true. I mean, it's true. Uh, I mean, people that we have labor organizers and, you know, and, and James so, Connolly fighting so, for like, I mean, wages. It's all, you know, look, society is not like, I mean, the way that I look at it is like, is like a volume knob, right? You can't either, at either end it's, you know, but like you can move things a few degrees to one side and it'll make life a lot better for a lot of people. And so, um, and more just, even though you're not fixing all the inequality and all the problems in society, but you can do it, turn it a little bit. And that's already a huge thing. Um, I don't know, but, but about the internet, again, it's a reflection of society. So I think we have to start with society and the internet it will follow through from that if we have an idea of what to do about society in general. We're, we're, uh, we've got two more questions. Yeah, you please, sir. Yeah, in, in times of political crisis, or just crisis, uh, you sometimes read the paper about a country here or there uh, shutting down access to the internet, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering to what extent can that truly be effective, you know? Yeah. Because I mean, it, it, it's something which can happen, I think, to some degree, but I'm not really sure just how North Korea yeah. Effective, effective. I mean, like, I mean, yeah. There's times when, let's say, you know, at a at a at a, pro, at a time of uh, revolt and revolution, you try to stop, you know, political movements that are con uh, using the internet to organize to try to stop them from 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 growing. You can shut the internet off. You, you like China, uh, for instance, or you can understand that the internet is now a, 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 a conduit of, of foreign influence and a foreign potential destabilization. Um, and so you want to control that transmission over your borders so that you can pr protect your, your country and you know, the ruling elite of the country wants to protect its power and protect society uh, in its own image you know, of it. Um, and it works. It works. China created its own internet. You know, it's, it's kind of walled itself off from, from the world, but it's, um, it's, it, it, it can work. Uh, you know, Iran has its own internet. You know, it's it's it functions as a society. It, it's 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 a porous membrane, but it's still controlled. Um, I mean, you know, the internet isn't a fundamental to life. It's not food. It's um, I think it'll cause it'll it can cause a lot of um, instability. You know, depending on how much it'll piss people off inside that country, or if it'll cause further um, sort of rebellion against. It. Um, Rebellion against uh, the, the government, like in Russia, it's it's always like you know that that could happen, you know, because Russia is moving more and more to 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 clamp down on the internet, and I, and a large sector segments of the population would be against that, and are against it already, but it hasn't moved to the point of to the point of uh, like it would tip the scales, um, and so um, yeah. Well, you just the last thing you said was the internet's not food. Yeah. But it actually is for a lot of people. I mean, not too long ago, I can't remember which town, but people who are issued food stamp cards can have those shut down at any time or not function at any time. 
So I don't, I don't. You you mean, but they, but they, it seems but like you've been focusing on the social aspect of the internet. Yeah. But there's this real, in my opinion, yeah. more dangerous financial aspect that everybody's relying on with bank transfers, credit card purchases, identity theft. Yes. Maybe I'm the only one who's not on Facebook and doesn't do any banking online. Mm -hmm. I'm still going into the teller and getting my cash and mm -hmm. paying her to keep her employed. But it's very real that that that's a huge mechanism of control. I mean, the more and more people that continue to use credit cards and online purchases or Amazon, you're not going to have the choice to go into a Walmart pretty soon. Well, Amazon's a big question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're not going yeah. to have, but that's you're but, not gonna you have know. the mailman coming yeah. by your door every day or checking on your neighbors. So there's that real aspect. So to me, that's more dangerous control. The, the uh, identity theft of well, you know, that controls your credit and whether you can get a loan. Yep. Who's going to get a loan? Oh, my credit sucks. Steal my identity, please. <laughs> 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 right, right, right. Just rent it out to some hackers. Maybe they'll be able to. Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think we had one more question, right? You wanted to. Yeah, you. Yes, in the, yeah, yeah, in I, the beard. I'm wondering, um, we're given this long history of the internet as a, a surveillance mechanism. Uh, to, to what extent, you know, like, say, putting aside the, the question of. You know, say that this was all like nationalized tomorrow, and we had the political will and the political imagination to have that politics. To what extent are we left to reckon with uh, the material infrastructure that the question of surveillance is built in mm -hmm. to to the built stuff that actually makes the internet? I'm sorry, man. Um, can you repeat the first part of that question? <laughs> I, was just, I drifted off. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. No, I mean, exactly. I really like. I, I, please just repeat the question. Sorry, I just had a slight. Um, I'm just wondering to, to what extent in this the long history of the internet yeah. that the surveillance mechanisms and the as a system of control is mm. is baked into the physical stuff that we have and we take for granted as the internet. I think it's very much uh, surveillance is is is. A function of computer technology almost going back to the beginning, going back to uh, the first computer devices, computational devices, the punch card tabulators. They were invented to count people for the U.S. Census. That's what really they were, the, and that of course led to IBM. Um, I mean, they counting people and counting and trying to understand the world and managing complex systems usually involves managing people. Uh, and, uh, usually, you know, and and the the first computer was built to manage or count count American citizens, and so. Uh, or not just citizens, but just Americans uh, living in uh, living in the country. Um, look, and surveillance is something. Surveillance is something that isn't evil or bad in itself. There are there's good forms of surveillance. Like for instance, you know, um, the EPA has to surveil uh, refineries, has to surveil uh, various. Uh, Enterprises that, in, that that deal with toxic chemicals, so that are used to at least. Uh, so exactly, you want surveillance. You're for surveillance. You are for surveillance. You, okay. Um, so there's good surveillance, and you can't really have a uh, over, you know oversight or democratic oversight or any kind of oversight without the ability to surveil, to watch, to make sure that laws are being followed and regulations are being followed and things are being done properly, right? And to to take action based on that surveillance. That is surveillance and control. You know. The IRS engages in surveillance and control. The EPA engages in surveillance and control. Um, you know, the Social Security uh, Agency administration ages and engages in some some form of surveillance and control. I mean, these things are not necessarily bad. Uh, in fact, they can be very good and beneficial. And so, I think again, these systems have surveillance built into them. Computers are were designed were created to deal with complex, large data sets and big numbers, and to manage man, to help government and corporations manage the complex world and complex operations. And so, but how, it's, so it's all about and how it's done and to what end, rather than the actual function itself, right? So surveillance and control are not problems in and of itself. And so, um, and so that's why I think when we talk about you know, fixing the internet, we actually have to fix society because it's what you're doing the surveillance for and what you're doing the control for. If it's for the greater good, that's a great thing. If it's for, uh, if it's for, if it's just for enriching a small elite, that's a bad thing. And so I think that's, I think, where we have to focus on something much more fundamental. But I think I'm being timed out here. So, yep. <laughs> Yeah,
Okay. Good job,